for a minute and ask the audience whether you have any specific question related to the previous hours or eight minutes. Okay? Yes. Please. But uh, the GE story is, is really the best practice, I think. I, I have talked to many CEOs uh, promoting integrity in business, and, and of course, this is one of the best examples. But, uh, but I, I was always confronted with the fact that their everyday decisions override all these uh, principles, and, uh, and the everyday business is different to the nice principles. Uh, even even if I spoke with non hypocratic CEOs and with, with adequate resources in a company, that was one of the <coughs> things they said. And the other thing I experienced is that, uh, that companies normally implement these kind of systems when there is an enforcement, uh, a, a pressure from outside. Either a fine from the <coughs> Exchange Commission or a competitor because of a competitor or whatever. Um, and what do you think the, the motivation behind GE was? So what, what was the reason that, uh, that it made GE different to the rest of the companies? Yeah, let me answer. Maybe the CEO's personality. Yeah, Maybe no. the I don't know. Well, I think the first question, if I understood it correctly, was does all this highfalutin stuff get blown away when they're sort of on the ground business decisions? I and, and, and I said, I, and when I said to be, the first principle was the CEO's consistency and commitment, and I said, but one of the things they said was there's no cutting of corners to make the numbers um, and you're one strike and you're out. If you mean that, then the little decisions, the daily decisions, are taken with that into account. That you, you know, you're supposed to try to do the right thing because there will be consequences. Um, I mean, that's really the critical question is do you have, again, I remember there's the negative culture, the rules-based sanctions, and then there's the positive, the affirmative culture. And you certainly have to have the former, and it's great to have the latter. Um, but if you have the former, um, and you've got a system where uh, things are reported, or there's good auditing, or you can detect these things, I mean, again, the critical thing in these systems is prevent, detect, and respond, um, people run, run risks. They can't just get away from it because it's a business decision. So that's what it's all about. I mean, does it in fact constrain people when they're making choices so that they don't cut corners? I mean, that's the, that's the point. Um, and uh, again, I, I, no company's perfect, but you have to have a culture where that's the way you operate. And that's the way they operate, whether you're in Western China or Western United States or Western Europe, um, you know, one culture, uniform global culture. And it requires, obviously, in places like China, which is, you know, developing and changing and is at a different stage than Western Europe and the United States, more like the United States in the late 19th century <laughs> when things were wild and crazy. Uh, so that's the answer to, to, uh, to one. Um, clearly, as I also try to indicate, why do you do this? You do it partly defensively because you don't want to get caught in a big scandal. So one why is to avoid the catastrophic risk. There is no question about that, um, that uh, you don't, you don't want to be in J.P. Morgan situation or BP in the Gulf or Siemens on bribery, or you know, name it, or the uh, all these banks in the LIBOR scandal. You don't want to be there. Yeah, I you understand that, but it, in GE's was before. No, and, and so in G's in G's case it was a com in, in G's case it was a combination. Things G's was hardly a perfect company before I came, but when Welch was CEO, we had a uh, fraud with the Defense Department compared to things today was tiny. I mean, it was like thirty million dollars <laughs> as opposed to five billion dollars, <coughs> but it was on the front page of the papers, uh, it got, you know, his attention. It wasn't the kind of company he wanted. Uh, so, th w you know, we had, uh, we had plenty of issues. This Israeli case, it, we, we got good marks for handling it well, but that happened on, when I was there. Um, so, and that, that was a front page story, and he was hauled in front of the Congress of the United States. Now, he was congratulated because he basically cleaned it up and did it the right way. So, uh, it's always fear of the mess, um, as well as I think you have to have that deep belief that the values of the employees are critical and you can't have great values unless you've got ethics and law. I mean, I, I just, I'll, I'll defer to my friend, the anthropologist, but I just don't, I just don't think you get values without structures around them. Yes. yes. Uh, hi, I'm Shabir from Hungary. I just, um, 
basically following on her question, I'm, I'm having a little bit of an issue. I think I think what you're saying is completely right, right? I mean, it was adopting uh, by CEOs to adopt integrity as a measure. However, <coughs> what she was asking, I think, is compromising, always compromising short-term uh, gain versus long-term doing the right thing. I think um, we do learn from the fact that, okay, these are the losses, these are the damages that can occur, but it might be easier for a CEO to accept or to actively buy into the integrity concept if there were positive cases, meaning what I can gain on a long term by, uh, in a quantifiable way, uh, by adopting an, an, an integrity as a value. Is there such a, um, such a research that would be able to quantify? The, the, the problem really is that you're, you, when you're talking about prevention, this is true in every field, how do you measure the investment in prevention with the failure to prevent? I mean, you don't, it, and so what you have to do is by analogy say, we need to basically do competition law because if you get in front of the EU and you've got a problem, it can cost this amount of money. We have to worry about environmental law because if we blow up our rig in the Gulf of Mexico, it's going to cost us $80 billion. <laughs> um, you know, we shouldn't bribe all over the world because the CEO, the head of the board, the head of all the divisions are all going to go um, and it's going to be a mess for semen. So to some extent, and it was always hard when you were asking for resources, bring it down to an even more practical question. When I would go in and have to say to the CEO, I need more people in China, we're growing at an X percent rate in China and we only have a small compliance legal finance staff. It's, it's, it's not the right size given the size of the business. And he'd say, well, you know, what will happen? I said, well, you know, if we have a big problem, the, the investment is going to be that we didn't make is tiny compared to the amount of problem, whether it's internal resources or external resources or reputational harm or all sorts of harm, is tiny, tiny compared uh, to the bad consequences. So you have to argue by analogy to other situations um, which are very frequent these days. It's easy because there's so much in the newspapers um, about bad things happening. Um, I guess in terms of, you know, you can always motivate people by showing them, uh, you know, a pain that they can gain. Not just a fear of loss, right? But in terms of what you can gain on the long term. It's like brand building, sorry, yeah. I mean marketing, right? So it's like brand building. It's very difficult to quantify. Yeah, no, I agree, because you may recall that I said that there were two different sets of reasons. One was the negative one, the avoidance of the catastrophe but the other were the positive reasons in the company, in the marketplace, in the in global society. And a lot of it depends on sort of looking in the mirror and understanding that those values that you have are critical to how your business works. And that that, at the end of the day, is what's so important. And that you can't have those values unless you have respect for norms, um, whether they're ethical or legal norms. Um, and so there, I, think, I think there is absolutely a positive case to be made, and I think at the end of the day, that's really what CEOs should care about most, um, creating the kind of company that they want with the right kind of values, uh, which makes it a sustainable company, and makes it a, a happier company, makes it a more productive company. I, don't, I think there's probably <coughs> plenty of, of uh, data on um, if people feel good about the company, how much more productive they are, how much they work longer hours, they, there are all sorts of good things that happen in terms of, of both employers and customers and suppliers if you have these kinds of values. So I, that, I, I, my guess is there's a, a fair amount of literature about that. Thank you. Yeah, on the positive side. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well it, 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 it's something I wanted to push a little bit more on this because I think it's very important. You say that, of course, values are something, but, but values are not everything like without structures. But the issue is that structures, they are made by people. So actually... No, I didn't say they weren't any. They, uh, they're, they're, they're critical whether you have the structures or not, but I'm saying it's better you can get the values if you also have respect for law and, and ethics. That's, okay. that's all I'm saying. Okay. If you, if, if, yeah, if you, if you don't, if you basically are contemptuous yeah. of law and ethics, yeah. you're going to have a hard time convincing people to be honest, you know, candid, fair, 
reliable, trustworthy. That's all. Yeah, it's true because because the issue is actually that if you if if you're actually like as you said in the beginning, trying to compare local laws like about like corruption, anti-corruption, this kind of things, there are very like similarities among like a lot of laws. Like like there are very nice nice kind of examples that what counts as as, as bribery like in Italy doesn't <coughs> fit with what counts as bribery like in the UK in certain cases. So actually it, is, it, is, it, is it easy to set standards for this kind of things? Of course, the US was the first one to set that, but can you actually like, like maintain this big standard? Well, I mean, that's what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about the, the problems with some of these conventions, like the OECD convention, which does ask the industrialized community to basically accept these anti-bribery laws, and it's been a very mixed pattern. Yes, ma'am. Um, we're going to talk about that in the fourth. No, no. We're, we actually we're going to talk about that in the, the fourth section is on government and and, and business. Um, generally speaking, you know, I believe that everybody has a right to petition the government and give their points of view. I think the problem is we have such inequality of resources in doing that that the corporations may have a outsized. Uh, influence beyond where their 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 relative position in the society. They're not the only interest in society, and so it's the classic: how do you represent the unrepresented <coughs> in in both you know basic legal matters um, and in the ma in the sort of the adversary process of developing regulation and legislation. So I don't think there's anything wrong per se with lobbying. I think there is something wrong when the influence is disproportionate because they have money and others don't. And, and, we, and we, you know, we have to deal with money uh, and politics and we have to deal with control of experts and all sorts of things. Ben, I have a question. How was the Israeli case discovered? Uh, it was discovered by um, the Israelis. We, this was not, we often discover things ourselves, but, but I got a call on a Sunday afternoon saying that in the Jerusalem Post there was a story that the GE uh, marketing manager in Israel and the head of procurement of the Israeli Air Force had a Swiss bank account with $18 million in it. So that's, that, that, how the that's, that's, that's defined as a bad day. So how the Israel is discovered? Um, was there a, a kind of announcement or a whistleblowing? I, I think they had done some investigations of the general because general. As, as is often the it's case suspicious of that. yeah as is often the case with people who are taking money illicitly they buy the car they have the girlfriend they yeah. you know they take the trips to Paris too frequently um, that he was living a little bit beyond so it was not because of your system detected we did we, we detected a lot but in this particular case no we had a, we did, in fact we had a similar case um, uh, which is <laughs> where TEPCO, which is much in the news because it owns Fukushima and all the reactors that were part of the tsunami. Uh, basically, we, GE made uh, nuclear steam supply systems, the guts of a nuclear plant, the, the actual thing that creates the, the heat that boils the water that makes the energy. Um, and TEPCO was our biggest customer after the U.S. because Japan has, I don't know, 40 active reactors at that point. Lots of, they wanted us to, to falsify safety data that they had to give to the to MITI, to the, the Japanese regulators. They asked us, as the maker of the um, nuclear system, to falsify data that we would give to them. We would raise routinely little issues that were, would be categorized as safety issues. It wasn't, they weren't safety critical, the plant wasn't going to blow up. But, but they were so afraid of criticism in Japan. Again, all these things have enormous histories. Let's go back to Hiroshima. You know, nuclear power was very prevalent but very controversial. Um, and that was one where, where we found out that basically we had been, uh, some of our employees had been doing what TEPCO had asked. And needless to say, um, two officers got fired. Again, about 20 people got fired because it had been going on for about t three years. Mercifully, TEPCO got blamed. We didn't get blamed. And nothing happened. It, it, never, it never was it affected the safety of the plant, but it was safety, it was safety information. Um, so that was one where we, we found that in an audit. So it, it, just, it just depended. Um, but th there were plenty of good-sized problems that 
you know, it may not have been through the whistleblowing system. It may have been through our own internal audit um, or, the, or the legal or finance staffs smelling something and going after it. Yeah. Okay. Um, this one, <laughs> we have an hour to deal with corruption. Okay, no problem. Um, what I really want to talk about is uh, if you're sitting, put yourself in, in my situation or put yourself in a situation where you're not an entrepreneurial company, but you're a big company around the world, um, how do you deal with the problem of corruption? Um, and let me ask, I'm going I'm to try a Socratic experiment um, rather than mouthing off for an hour. If you were in a, in a you're a multinational, um, and let's make you Siemens rather than GE, make you European, um, and you're in China, and virtually all your competitors are bribing, um, it's just the way that business is done, um, should you bribe? No hypocrisy. Hmm? I say no hypocrisy in the answers. No, I mean, you, you, it's the price of doing business. You, you, the, the, if you, you know, there's a, it's much, 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 much harder to get orders. China's a big market. And let's assume uh, for a minute that there's no law, because I, I don't, I don't want to make this a law class. Let's just say you've got to decide whether as a matter of ethics you should bribe or not when mo many of your competitors, not all, not GE, but the Japanese, the Chinese, are bribing, bribing to get, get orders. So ethics now, not law. Bribe, no bribe. Have to, you know, have to do it. Very hard to compete. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, the result will be much worse because um, unless uh, nobody knows this, uh, <laughs> most, everyone, most people know this. Uh, the, uh, from the external, there are a huge pressure on that one, so this company will be much harder. Actually, uh, if, if a local company do this one, they may not get so much power, but uh, if a multinational company, uh, but let's say, let's say, okay, you're, you're, you're working for Siemens and there's very lax enforcement in China. Um, and, and let's assume that there's probably a law in China, as there is in virtually every country, about domestic bribery. Um, so that if you're in China, it's not that Germany's going to go after you, it's that the Chinese might find you out. But the Chinese don't enforce the law because many Chinese companies do it. Uh, and I don't mean to pick on China. That would be true in Indonesia, Vietnam, in a lot of these countries. So, you know, the, the chances that you'll be discovered are minimal. They're there, but it's not a certainty, although you have people inside the company. Um, I would like to um, quote my father's example, who builds a building for NATO in Hungary, and um, maybe it's not, yeah, um, he, like in, build, in construction industry in Hungary, you have to give bribes if it's a, a, a big big um, project like that. Have to? And you ha kind of, yes. And uh, it's usually about You don't have 20, to, you don't no, have to. <laughs> it's usually 20%. But what happens um, with these large projects, then uh, someone is even more uh, eager to get, gain more money and somehow tries to steal the whole amount. So I think it's um, to have a bribery at the beginning usually causes other um, problems later on. So I think it's a, again a trust issue. Like if you don't have um or um yeah it's if you don't have um um a transparent or um like the stand the if you don't set the standards at the beginning then in the next step there will be other issues. Okay, I'm the CEO and you guys are business leaders who are around the table and we've got this opportunity to bid on <coughs> some big power station in China or some construction job in Hungary. <coughs> and I want to know, should we pay the bribe? Because if we don't pay the bribe, you know, we don't, if we don't pay, we don't play. And, you know, if it's not enforced um, and, and the law is, let's just, it, it's, it's, it's not, it's not it's, there's, some, there's, a little, there's a little risk, but not a great risk. Um, and maybe the, the, the legal fine will be 
you know, cost of doing business. I won't, I won't come out behind. I might not make as much money. Peter, what should I do? Yes, sir. Tell first, me. First of all, I really don't, don't like her example because I used to be the general counsel for Stevens. <laughs> I, well, not the general counsel. Well, I, was, I was brought into uh, in cleaning up the company, so I was brought in after the corruption scandal. Well, you know, I, I'm, I'm very dear friends with Peter uh, Solmson. I don't know if you know I was that. part of his team. Yeah. Um, and I and mentioned, you know, he's, he's literally, as we speak tonight, he's doing the case at the Harvard Business School. But go ahead. Tonight, and I was today. confronted with this question too often. I, I mean, it's, uh, it has nothing to do with Hungarian law, or it has nothing to do with whether they can catch you or not. It has something to do with uh, company values. It has something to, to do how do you how you are doing business, you should not think that you can take China and let's say I've got an anti-bribery policy for the whole world, but in this specific case in China, I'm allowed to bribe because everybody does this. I was hearing too often this argument and uh, I'm aware of different practices that there is a way around it. If you can just uh, convinced, uh, for instance, big players in the industry and create a kind of uh, integrity pact or something. So just buy, have the buy-in of others to collaborate with you and raise the standard. The over okay, standard. Let, me, let me make this, let's make this real though. That's fine. I'm the CEO though, and I'm asking you, should I bribe or not? Now tell me, make an argument to me as if I'm the CEO as to why, I mean, I respect very much what you've done. Believe me, I'm not trying to be difficult. Um, and you know, I think Siemens did a great job. We're going to talk about that a little bit. But um, what's what's the argument? Why why shouldn't I bribe? I would, in fact, uh, just how do you, how do you say it to me? What what is it what is it going to do to the company? Uh, it would do obviously more harm than this particular business. But what we've learned uh, from the Siemens scandal is that it's always, on the long run, it's always more risky and also more costly to bribe than to refrain from bribing. So I would advise you not to do it because of And what, are the, what is the cost? Let, let's assume it doesn't work out well. What are the costs? Enumerate for me the costs that, 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 I, I, have to, that I have to worry about because I'm, I'm a CEO making decisions. I don't, I don't think it's possible to enumerate the costs because you cannot know what happens. Well, the types, if not the amounts. Uh, it's your image, it's your, um, um, what could be the cost, for instance, if you get banned from public procurement, let's say, for five years? We had the same in Hungary. We had a ban not only for Hungary, but in fact for, 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 the, for the whole continent, for Europe. Siemens was banned from participating in public procurement for five years in a certain type of businesses. Is it high enough as a cost? I think so. Okay. What else? You're anybody, right. anybody. I mean, fun. I mean, <coughs> what, what are the other, what are the, what are the other in company arguments? We're going to get to, there are a lot of arguments having to do with what happens to the society in which you're bribery. Um, but let's just stay with the company for a second. It's, um, it leaves you completely vulnerable for your future brand. And you have to set the tone at the so time. So whatever, however little you think the risk is, there is a sort of risk that you really can't quite figure out how big it is. I mean, you can say that they don't enforce it, but we were just talking about whistleblowers. Somebody in the company can go out and make a big deal about it, right? And all of a sudden, it's become a big issue. Well, risk is uncertainty, and you won't really know, but we have enough history to see what happens to companies who do delve into that realm. And I don't think it's worth putting the company at risk for this vulnerability. You want to be a leader. GE is a leader. You must create standards that are high above everything. Okay, but I want to keep pushing back. You know, I'm in China. I'm Siemens. There's huge infrastructure possibilities for the next 20 years. You know, if I don't bribe, I don't pay. That's a huge loss that I'm taking. It's not just one, it's not one deal. It's, it's basically the way business is done let's make it India. I, mean, I, I don't want to pick on China because we, we have a colleague from China, but, um, you know. Even more from India. Yeah. <laughs> to make it the United States. Yeah. Um, uh, but, so, I mean, that's all cool. Look, I'm playing a Socratic game, but 
what's the answer to the, you know, not just one deal, but a pattern that involves billions of billions of dollars of sales? Yeah. I had another example when um, we couldn't do business uh, because <coughs> we our driver in. So actually, we bought um, the company I was working for bought a big train in India, exactly, and uh, we didn't drive the relevant officers. So the government just took our train. So um, I think it was a little bit foolish then not to drive uh, the relevant oh. officers. Um, <laughs> maybe you don't want to hear this because, but uh, it's. And, yeah, it wasn't yeah. to be easy. Uh, if, if the company choose to drive, actually is an indicator of the company is a failure because it's a, just a lose trust to the whole society, no matter it's China or India. <coughs> because um, he, it's the company didn't uh, like, uh, manage to use other methods. <coughs> actually, there's a huge, uh, uh, a, lot of, a lot of automotive probably um, more comfortable to this culture, but uh, the company don't find this one. He just uh, considered to bribe this uh, typical value of the whole strategy for the whole market. Right. Yes, well, I think the other side of the coin is, I think as uh, being from Siemens, we should be confident that we're one of the best at what we do. And we say, hey, look, China, this is the way we do business. We don't bribe. Uh, and if you want you know, the best, um, you know, the best guy for the job, you take us the way we are without the bribes or you leave us. And if you want to go for the second best or the fifth best, you know, you deal with it. You come to us when you're ready to play our game without bribing. I, I think it was coming, I would just uh, use media for saying the thing. <laughs> do you want to talk the media, the news media to narrate the same word for Islamic as CEO, I would not uh, drive, and I would just say it in the news media, the same thing, how important Siemens would be to China. Let's talk for a second. Put, put the company aside for a minute. What does bribery do in these developed societies? What, what, are, the, what are the bad things that result from a system of bribery um, in, in these societies? For, put, put aside multinationals, just generally uh, the broad pattern of corruption. What, what are some of the things that aren't so cool? It enriches that? the already corrupt. Right. The person you're enriching is actually not the person who probably is most deserving of any sort of enrichment. Yeah. I think bribery limits competition. Right. Absolutely destroys competition. Yeah. But to answer the question, should you bribe or not, uh, if it's, you should weigh and measure how much cost is involved by, you know, uh, being in China or India for 20 years or not, if it's a one off. You want to keep your career open, uh, that might be something you don't want to do. But if it's a 20 year contract, you should look at the fee that's involved or the tax and think of it that way as is this a cost of doing business? And how bad is a $20,000 additional tax? Well, it won't be, it won't be $20,000. Or whatever cost. It'd be you a lot more than that. It's more realistically rather than. You're the almighty, and it's a black and white issue. You have no idea you know, what people you could be helping with a tax. Um, you certainly don't want Junior, to. You don't have any idea where the money is going. In that, that is, well, yeah, but. Probably not going to the poor, though. Um, mm -hmm. True. But if you look at it in a longer term, rather than short term gain, that might be worth it. You have to ask, is it worth it? Okay, let, let's come back to the company, but I want to just keep going for a second. What, what are the other kinds of harms to society? Competition? It makes uh, procurement more expensive because it's kind of plus 10%, plus 20% if this is embedded in the system, but it's also harmful for the country's economy. Okay, what else? Yeah? It encourages the circulation of black money, so money that's not taxable and Right. It deviates quality because once you bribe, your costs are up, and then to make up money, it decreases the quality of that you use. So it deteriorates the quality. Yeah, the, the general counsel of Siemens was quoted as saying um, that if we spend all the money that we used on bribes to actually do R&D, 
<coughs> we might have, back to your point, we might have had better products that even in a society that bribes might have been, might have been persuaded, might, 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 I don't know. Um, what does it do to, uh, to rule of law? Does it help rule of law? Yeah. But I think a lot of these countries, like for example India or China, you have like really, um, the laws are not that strict and um, there are no, I think it's just very difficult to make, uh, to do any business um, without getting involved in this. And um, uh, if your company's future depends on it, if your company is going to, <coughs> going to go bankrupt and losing um, so much money, um, I think, it's nice to think of um, ethical, it's, it's, it's important to think of that ethical aspect, but sometimes you just have no choice, um, I think. Yeah. I think company like Siemens always have a choice. Yeah. I think the point here is that even if you are acting locally, and if you are a local CEO in China, I will tell you, even if you are acting locally, you need to think globally because you need to share the values the company shares and you are not supposed to sell the future of this company in a global sense for a particular local success business. That's the point, I think. That's certainly a good point. Well, let's, let's the, no, the, the effects on the society are distorts marketing, competitions, breeds cynicism, cynicism, cynicism among citizens, it stymies the rule of law, it damages government legitimacy, it corrodes the integrity, of the private sector, it impairs development and poverty reduction, um, and basically is, makes it very hard for the society to develop. That's on the societal side, but the company clearly has a strong interest in the rule of law, rule of contract, protection of property rights, legitimate government. I mean, that, you know, everybody from Milton Friedman to to the most liberal economist would say that, you know, property rights and the rule of law is the most important thing in terms of economic development. So one, one argument against it is just the societal impact. Then the question is, well, if, if I don't do it, is that going to change society? Well, if you don't do it and other big companies don't do it, at least on the big projects, it can have an effect. Whether it's going to change the society tomorrow is an open question. But then let's go back to the, yeah, go ahead. So what if Siemens does, decides not to build a, a nuclear power plant and it goes to the highest bidder who bribed and the, um, the power plant is not to quality. And rather than having a perfectly fine turbines and no chance of contamination, something terribly wrong goes in and then something terribly wrong happens. Was it worth the environmental cost uh, well, you never I mean, look. It's a, is it a fair? Is it a fair point? Sure. But the all we're debating is sort of all these countervailing factors and where you're going to come out. I mean, that that's a fair point. You don't know that it's not. You know, the French may take the deal um, rather than the Germans, and the French build a lot of reactors and are going to be fine. Or Hitachi may take it. Hitachi's a perfectly responsible supplier. They're not. They're they are aware that nuclear power is dangerous. They you know they're not necessarily going to give something like that as opposed to a coal mine or a road. Uh, to a bum who's going to blow the society up. So, but it's possible. I mean, it's a factor. It's, it's one way to look at it. Um, but in terms of, I, I just wanted to say that on the, from the societal point of view, there are a lot of things that are clearly deleterious about corruption, about bribery. And for that reason, companies might want to do it. But let's go back to the risk of the company. If you believe in this performance with integrity stuff, um, I think the point that you made and I'd be interested in what other people think, is how can you make, remember it's, we're talking about global culture, how do you make exceptions? Don't you have to basically, if you've said that this is our culture and we're going to behave this way, we think that over the long term and in a variety of other settings, uh, it's critically important for the company, then don't you just have to do what you said? You, it's in, completely inconsistent that we're, not, we're going to have a no bribe policy around the world except in China or except maybe in Indonesia or we're, we're going to be transparent and honest, but we're going to hide our deals in China because we can't keep them open on the books. Um, so to some extent, if you start doing this from a company point of view, doesn't it basically undermine the whole concept of fusing performance with integrity? So I'm going to argue against it. I mean, just honestly, that, that, was, that was my view. We had a no-bribe policy. 
and we, we competed against Siemens and won a lot of the time. Um, we had higher margins and bigger share, even though they bribed everywhere and we didn't. Um, and <laughs> yeah, not at the time, not, not maybe not after uh, the cleanup. And so it was true before the, before the scandals. Um, anyway, does anyone, I mean, what do people think about that sort of basic fundamental point? The whole point of the first lecture was that th this is, you can either agree or not agree. I mean, I have a point of view, you don't have to agree with it. Um, this is, I'm not trying to proselytize, I'm just trying to explain, you know, sort of what I think is the case. Um, but if you believe that, it's pretty hard to sort of say, you can start making exceptions because um, then all of a sudden it's just Swiss cheese. It's just everything's riddled with inconsistencies and hypocrisy. It, on stuff like this, especially in big organizations where, as I said before, word gets around, people need clear, unambiguous messages. If the message is too complicated, well, it's okay to do it here, but then why is it okay to do it here? Uh, you, have, you have a big issue. Did you want to say that? Yeah, my thought on that is, um, once you set that tone, it's a sliding scale. I mean, once you set the tone of exceptions. Yeah, of acceptance. Exceptions or acceptance. Yeah, either or. Yeah. It just becomes the norm of the company, and you just cannot crawl back. I don't think. It's the same with cheating. If you cheat in anything, it will come home to roost. Eventually, it will cave. Everything will cave in eventually. You can only get so far by cheating. All right, let's let's do, pursue this just a little bit farther. There, what is the risk that you will go back to? You know, your you seem to be one who's saying we should balance everything, and it could be okay. I may be mischaracterizing your position, but that's sort of what I'm hearing. What's the risk that you'll be found out? And think about the different ways in which you could be found out that you've done this. What are the ways in which it could be found out? Um, tabloids. Um, well, the, how would the tabloids get the, the information? It could be a whistleblower. Okay, so whistleblower is clearly one because there, and this happens all the time. Um, sometimes, in fact, there are programs that provide financial incentives to whistleblowers, and sometimes people just think it's wrong and blow the whistle. And they don't blow the whistle inside, they blow the whistle outside. Okay, that's one. What's another one? Government gets overthrown, regime change, and then when the and it, invariably, and again, many of your students have all this. Invariably, when the new government comes in, it always comes in, in part because the old government's been corrupt. One of the many reasons that these governments get thrown out. So they then have a anti-corruption <coughs> commission, and they go through the files of the Ministry of Power and the Ministry of Health, um, and guess what they find? They find Siemens problems. Um, and then not only did the ministers who were the former government have problems, <coughs> but someone's got a pretty big problem. So that's another way. And that's, now you might say in China there's not going to be an overthrow, but there could be reformers. Uh, it's not out of the question. Um, how else could this things happen? Well, there could just be enforcement. In other words, the, the government could take a real hard look, you know, with subpoena power, which exists even in China. I mean, they have, they have the sort of a Potemkin village of the legal system um, that they can decide for political reasons that they're going to go look at the contracts and dig into the stuff, and there it is. So enforcement with compulsory process is another way. So here are three risks, whistleblowers, um, <coughs> uh, government enforcement, a regime change. Um, you're the CEO, and we put on a big, if it becomes known, I think we can agree it's going to be an explosion because it's a big contract, which is the only reason you're bothering to do it in the first place. Do you take that risk? I'm now, I'm, I'm giving you, I mean, I'm, I've given you an argument, a sort of a pure normative argument that if you're going to have a performance and integrity culture, you don't compromise. You, you, you commit to it, you have a global culture, you have your ethical positions and you don't vary them, and you take your chances about losing business. I'm giving you a more real politique balancing one to go to your, you want to balance, 
how do you balance those kinds of risks when they're not knowable? Which, which way do you decide to go? You should err on the side of caution. I mean, because that, that, you don't know. And uh, it could be, I mean, you'd lose your job for sure. I mean, if you, if you were the decision maker and you said, sure, bribe away, and it popped out in the, in the Guardian or, you know, wherever, where, wherever it shows up. Um, anyway, the, re the exercise is worth it because this, this is one of the most common business problems that people have. Um, and you've got to make a decision, which is why I advocate that you need to think this through once <laughs> and then do it the right way because if you get into situational decisions on this kind of stuff, you're just dead uh, because it, there, there's, there's so many unknowns and it's so uncertain. Um, and the fact of the matter is, and my good friend may disagree with me, um, but we with a no bribe policy were able to convince, there are civil servants everywhere who want to buy on cost and quality, to your point, um, who may shape the uh, procurement. And in, Ch in China it's impossible to generalize it. There's, you know, there are parts of it that are corrupt, there are parts of it that are incredibly smart and good government types. You, you just, you don't know. And so that you basically have a no bribe policy and you go and you, you uh, go into procurements on cost and quality and see how you do. Uh, and the reality was, uh, really, I do think before the scandal, if you went back and looked, we had on most of these areas where we were, whether it was uh, health or, or power, we had both bigger share and higher margin <coughs> before the scandal. I know you'd argue that afterwards you guys you don't like gangbusters, but um, so anyway, it's a it's a it's a, it's a really uh, important fundamental uh, question that goes very. The, the reason I'm following up the first session with this one is this is where the rubber beats the road. This, is, this happens in every place uh, that you do business. All right, second related question. Um, there is something known as, these, this is called grand uh, corruption. Uh, there's something called petty corruption, which is basically paying off the customs uh, people, paying off the police uh, to just the, to, not, to not stop you, paying um, the the licensing authority to give you a permit to build. Basically, the, it, this, these are defined, these petty corruptions are defined as where you're paying people to do what they're supposed to do anyway. It's not like they're making big discretionary decisions on whether to buy this power system or that power system or this health care system or that health care system. <coughs> it's just, you know, um, should you be able to do the normal uh, aspects of, of commercial life in the society, and yet in many of these societies, Literally every time you move, you've got to pay somebody, you know, a bribe to get it done. Then it's not big. I mean, twenty dollars, fifty dollars, two hundred dollars. But everywhere you move, it's called. They're called facilitating payments. Is one or petty bribery? What's your What's your view on that? Yep. In Hungarian healthcare, um, it's it's quite often they give money to the doctor, and I think it's. I normally give some money to the doctor because I know I get better service. So if it's your health and you are awaiting the operation, would you give money or would you not um, in Hungary? Um, you, per, you as a person, as an yes. individual, as opposed to a company. I'm, I'm obviously talking about this now yeah. in a company yeah, setting. I mean, if you... Sorry. <laughs> no, no, it's okay. But I mean, if sure, if yes. that, we, that's, we, an indi we, that's an individual if choice. If you're, in, you're living in Hungary, you, you have to have an operation. Would you give money to the doctor to give you a better service, or would you not? Well, I'd rather keep it on the company side than, than <laughs> if you're going to make it my child, my child has a serious disease and I have to pay off the doctor or the child. You know, that's a, I, that to me that's a really different kind of calculus than what kind of company we are, which is, I think, what the class is about. So, so you know, if, you, if, you're, if you're a company and, you, and to get your telephone hooked up, to get, uh, to get your, cus your goods through customs, um, do you bribe or don't you bribe? Yeah. I, I think it's a slippery slope. If you pay one policeman for something, then um, guess how many more policemen are going to be at your door in the morning? If you pay one <laughs> telephone operator <laughs> something, guess how many telephone operators are going to be at your door in the morning? Or I'll tell that you pay this other telephone operator. I think you don't want to open that can of worms in some places. <coughs> yeah, I agree it's a slippery slope, and I, I don't know what kind of that I'd advocate for, but I mean, I've certainly worked in that environment, especially with the police, and it's the cost of doing business. 
and just like they show up and they get free this and free that and free coffee and you host their Christmas party and you also don't get the twenty thousand dollar fine that your next door neighbor got for you know having a broken handrail or something on the you know on the staircase. Well, but let's keep it on the company. But no, but something okay. as a bar or as a restaurant or whatever. I mean, you, it's a cost of doing business. You better not. Yeah, you know, it's not an envelope, but you certainly have to, you know, provide small. Right, well, let's make it even. Let's make it a multinational. Let's make it an iconic global okay, company, and not a not not a not a local not a local <laughs> not a local business. <laughs> not a local business. <laughs> you're the you're you you're, you're Miss uh, Hard Edge over there. What's what's your view? No, I don't want to present that, but it's um, we know cases of this if you're involved in trade. Um, especially in Nigeria. You want your supplies off the ship in Nigeria for your <coughs> franchising operation you have. It's, you must pay to get them off. Well, or, or not. I mean, not, some people don't even do business in Nigeria. For that reason. Yeah, I mean, the company I worked for for many years wouldn't do business in Nigeria because it was too corrupt. Because it, cause it, we could do it in China because we didn't have to bribe our way around the country. Right. Um, but in Nigeria for many years, or in Russia, um, it was so pervasive that you made a decision that you just weren't going to do it. So, it's, I mean, it's, it's a decision you can make. I'm not saying that we were right, but you can, you can make that decision. You can also make a decision not to make these payments because what are these payments lawful or unlawful, even though they're petty? In the law, what? And what, what would a general rule for international companies be in terms of the laws of the country they're in? What should you do? International laws of the country. Sorry? Adhere to them. Yeah, I mean, you know, in, in theory, you know, the, the, the general rule of multinationals is that you follow the law wherever you are. I mean, there may be some exceptions, and we're going to uh, explore that a little bit on when we talk about ethics, whether there are situations in which your ethical standards basically are, are in conflict with local law, and then you choose your standards about the local law. But that's a different situation than just not following the law. So every time you do this, I mean, there's, there's the risk that the cops are going to come after you and mobs to get their 20 bucks or their or 400 the fact that they know you or their 400 bucks or if, they, if you give in the tariff may go up you know, next month. Um, but there's also the small problem of, of, of not following the law. Anybody else on, on let, let's take a vote. We're going gonna, gonna, we're gonna to have, how many would make these small payments, these, these facilitating payments to get people to do you, you want to ask a question first yeah. to make it more complicated? Yeah, a little bit. <laughs> so GE has the clout to make the decision not to enter Nigeria. It makes the decision that it says, we as GE can choose not to bribe. So Mr. Administrator, we're, this is our bid, take it or leave it. Um, a lot of companies might not have that capability. And so therefore what I'm asking is, why are we in this position in the first place? As GE, why should we should have done an analysis before going into wherever we may be and have to pay the operator, the policeman, the traffic cop, and things like that all along the way? If there's an override policy, then this should kind of be a non issue. Well, we didn't go, no, I'm saying we didn't go to Nigeria. Well, no. Or, or, you may, or you may go and say, you know, let's see what conditions are actually on the ground. Is there, is there a way, is it a, is it a hundred percent, is it completely, you know, we're completely blanketed with demands or can we work our way through the system? You know, life's complicated. You don't, I mean, it's very hard a priori in a country that's big and complicated like Nigeria or China to sort of say no as opposed to going and testing it. Um, but as long as you test it and don't do it, and then you discover that you're frustrated, that seems to me an empirical test is just as good as an inductive test. Or no reason not to, not to do it that way. Okay, how many people would make, would make the small payments? <laughs> oh, come on. <laughs> All right. And how many people would not make the small payments? All right, it's just, it, just think about it. I mean, it, it, the reality was that we, in fact, had a policy that there was a presumption against it. 
But if there were a matter of health and safety or there were certain ex uh, exigent circumstances, we would pay the facilitating payment, even though it's legal under U.S. law, incidentally. U.S. has an anti-bribery law. Um, but it wouldn't be legal in India. That was point one. So we didn't have a blanket rule. We had, we had a rule but where the exceptions were, were very clear and the people on the ground couldn't make the decision. They had to literally come to the legal staff or the managers to get permission to do it. There, there was a presumption against doing it. So the question was, were there ever circumstances like you know, your child um, where, uh, where there, there, where there could be exception? And the view was that this was different than grand bribery. This really was petty uh, stuff, and it was, it was different, but, but it was always a rare exception. Secondly, we tried, <coughs> but we can't, you can't save the world. We worked with the Indian uh, civil servants and the Customs Bureau to try to computerize the system and increase the pay. Because the reason many of these people are asking for these kinds of payments, back to your point about the policemen, is they don't get, they get paid very, very little. And sort of it's like a little bit like, like waitresses and waiters at restaurants. I mean, it's just, it's sort of part of how they make a living. And so one solution is to upgrade, if the country's got the wherewithal to do it, is to professionalize and upgrade some of the areas where it's most uh, prevalent. And sort of licensing of businesses or customs would be examples. So that's, uh, that's, enough, that's another way of, uh, of, of dealing with it. Um, Okay, there, there are, there's some other uh, problems under the law or under this thing that are, that are really, really, really difficult. Um, one of them is the, the problem of third parties. That, you know, it's rare that you walk in to the power minister with a brown bag of cash and drop it directly on his or her desk and say, give us the project. That's not usually the way it works. Um, normally, uh, there's some kind of third party between you and the recipient of the bribe, the decision maker. Whether those are agents, consultants, sales reps, distributors, suppliers, partners, there are a whole variety, different, wide variety of third parties um, that, uh, that uh, basically the middlemen, if you will, between your cash and the recipient. Uh, and in many societies, however, you know, there are requirements that you need to have such people to do business. And that, that you have a hard time getting around with. So how do you, anyone have any ideas about things you can <coughs> do to, to reduce the risks of these third parties, which is really the huge, I mean, it's, it is the practical issue when you're, when you're trying to deal with this kind of stuff in the field and you're really working on it. Anybody have just any ideas? Just random ideas. It doesn't have to be organized, coherent at this point. Just things you might do. How to eliminate these third parties? I'm sorry? Uh, the question was how to eliminate. Well, either eliminate or, um, I mean, you can try to eliminate or how to control so that they're, they don't bribe. Or it's not a bribe. But you need quite often your business depends on this. Like, you, you either have a business if you Rather than so well, I'm, my question is, is there a way to sanitize or yeah. deal with these third parties? Or is it just, you know, are you just you know, giving into bribery in a different way? Yeah. We, ha we have it now. Um, for our friends that are talking about the construction in Hungary, we have the same thing in the States. And our developers just build a park. Or we give the money to something as a nonprofit. Do some, you mean some kind of? It, it's a. It's. It's not. It's more. You're doing something else, like doing something charitable, quote unquote. Sure. What? Sure. It's. It's purely legal. It's. It's not a bribery, but you are somehow getting the contract because you are doing something socially um, improving. <laughs> building a hospital. <laughs> yeah. and, that, and, and actually, you could, you could see, I, I, this, this gets you where I don't want to go, which is the technicalities of the law, what's your intent. And, you know, it could be legal or it couldn't be It could be either. But mine, mine's a sort of more basic question, which is how do you deal with these third parties, these sales reps, these agents that who the Minister of Power says, yes, you can bid on the contract, but you have to use an agent to come to us. You can't just come by yourself. We, you know, local 
know, local folks are important when you bid for these contracts. Oh, that's, those are administrative fees. Those are administrative fees. <laughs> yeah. Um, assuming you have a choice of which third party, is it you, you can choose in a given country, um, maybe you can choose the one that has the, the ones closest to your values. I mean, I know some kind, I think China, you, you need to sometimes form joint partnerships. And so you can choose the one that has maybe the best track record and try to work with them. Right. Yeah. Have dive, try and have direct uh, business relationship and rule these third parties out. I mean, I think, but uh, it's, it's, it's easier said than done. Maybe. Yeah. So anyway, without, without beating this to death, I mean, there are a whole variety of things. You, you need a written specification identifying the need and what specifically is going to happen, which has to be approved by a senior management of the company. And again, if these things don't work, you're going to lose the business, but you just accept that. I mean, that's just part, part of all this is to do it the right way, and if it doesn't work, then you just accept the fact that, you, that you're going to lose the business. And again, I think everyone's made the point that if you're a small or medium-sized enterprise as opposed to a huge multinational, it may look a little differently. Um, I, I happen to, th and I'll come back to that in a minute, I think small businesses, well, I'll say it right now, small businesses need, need to be careful too because for three reasons. Number one, they may want to be taken over and big businesses are pretty good at due diligence in terms of how much crap there is going on and if there's crap, either the purchase price changes a lot or you don't buy them. Uh, number two, Siemens can take four torpedoes amidships, but it doesn't sink. Um, you know, they put uh, stuff in the thing, the, stop the uh, water coming in, fix the engines, and it goes forward. And it's now, you know, it's recovered from its scandal. Um, so small companies, they t take four torpedoes amidships and they may just sink. Um, they may not be there anymore. And then third is just the question of what kind of business do you want to run? And that every one of you will face that choice. I mean, the, what I'm, the, these issues that I'm talking about today, <laughs> um, these are not abstractions. Uh, you know, and you, you've, got to, you've got to think, not just in the 20 minutes left in this class, uh, but as you think about business careers, um, the courage to talk back to the CEO, how, whether you want to bend the law, uh, what kind of person you want to be uh, when you're running a business. And you know that that everyone's going to decide for themselves, and some um, some small businesses don't want to run, don't want to do business that way. They they that's not the kind of people they are, the kind of company they want to be, and others do. <coughs> so, you know, there's the due diligence if you want to be bought. Uh, there's if you, there's the danger of getting hit, in which case you may die as opposed to just being wounded. Uh, and then there's the kind of company you want to be. There's a famous Harvard Business School case about Infosys, which is a famous Indian information company, which actually paid a huge fine <laughs> um, uh, today. Um, but the founder, uh, the business school case is about the founder who had raised money um, and was all well capitalized, and the, he was in India, and the telephone folks uh, asked for a bribe, a small bribe just to put in the phones of the company. I mean, he was capitalized, the investors were ready to go, had gotten a lot of publicity, and he just said, no, it's not the kind of company I want. And the telephone people, they couldn't believe it. So they came back three weeks later, he said, no. Three months later, same answer. And the, the moral of the story, at the end of the day, they did it with no bribe. Um, and that was, and he's held out as a, and that, at that point it was a tiny little company, it was just a startup, uh, and it's sort of a case a case, there, are other, there would be examples the other way. Anyway, uh, you know, you, you, certainly these rules for big iconic companies, you, there's a huge reputational globalization dimension to them, which is that you stand for globalization and you have to be triply careful about what you do so that, you know, you do not um, hurt uh, the globalization pro project, which, and we'll talk about that tomorrow in terms of supply chain. Um, so they are different uh, just by the nature of their size, and they have power as well uh, that uh, other companies don't have. For example, uh, in, terms of these <coughs> in terms of these third parties, not only do you have to have a sort of a written, a quite clearly clear written spec about what they're doing, you can check their resources and qualifications. Um, 
do they have knowledge experience in the industry? Do they, uh, have they, uh, are they well known to the business community or are they just, are they just a, a stray person who's going to take a check and pass it on? Uh, you can do this through a whole variety of, of public and private uh, things, including, if necessary, uh, police records, relation with company customers, conflicts of interest, business community in the U.S. and other places, terrorist cross matches, there are a whole series of things. Um, then with them, you have a whole set of commercial terms in your contracts, specification of work, fees within a reasonable range, that being the most important, that, you know, you, you're not going to give any contract of more than a couple percent, which would be the standard uh, fee for a real agent around the world. You're not going to give them 10 or 15 percent. It's not going to happen. Uh, you just have a cap on what you're going to do. Um, you also pay it in phases, and you pay it in country rather than Switzerland um, or in uh, 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 Liechtenstein or someplace like that. Um, you have audit rights. Uh, you have uh, ability to terminate a whole variety of things. And, uh, and you have a whole bunch of red flags for the people who are influencing or who are implementing the contract uh, if they request extra cash, if they have inflated invoices, uh, if they request that other partners or inv uh, uh, commercial entities get involved. Uh, so there are a whole variety of things that, that you can do. And again, I, the only reason I mention this is that this is just an example of the kind of specificity that you've got to get down to when you worry about this. If you've made a decision that you're not going to bribe, you've got the problems of the consultants, you've got problems of charitable contributions uh, that you mentioned, whether that's you know, for real or whether that's just baloney. You've got travel and living. Uh, you know, do you take them when they come to uh, Europe? Do you take them to Tour d'Argent? Um, and to Disney World and to the, a week in the Loire Valley or just take them to your facility and show them what the product is and send them back home. Um, and those are, those are off, there are lots of cases where those are big problems. Um, so these are, these are some of the, the really serious uh, issues uh, that, that you have to address. And as we discussed, the most important thing is that you have a very powerful uh, compliance program. Uh, prevent, detect, respond that I indicated uh, before and that, uh, that you, if you're <coughs> serious about this, it has to be all across uh, the globe and it has to be uh, something that the CEO deeply believes in. Now let's talk for a second about, about Siemens, which you're going to come to in the spring, but it's just, it's worth mentioning and I will be corrected by my experts sitting in front of me, um, but generally speaking, um, uh, after World War I, when, uh, World War II, excuse me, when it, not surprisingly a German company might have trouble in global markets, uh, it be, there began a practice of, of bribing for contracts, but that was not unusual. That was true of most multinationals around the world in this, in this period. Um, and that uh, then, there, then there was a law passed, uh, a conven an OECD convention, uh, which outlawed foreign bribery, as I indicated to you before, most countries have laws against bribery in country, so that if Siemens had bribed in Germany or GE had bribed in the United States, um, that would have been standard law, that that would have been against uh, uh, the rules. But what the United States had early on, uh, coming out of the Watergate scandal, was a law that prohibited foreign bribery. In other words, if an American company went and bribed in Japan, or bribed in China, or bribed in Romania, or bribed in Hungary, uh, that was a violation of U.S. law. That U.S. law then became the basis for an international convention, so-called OECD convention, um, and that was then ratified by the, at that time, 34 industrialized nations, including Germany, and when they uh, ratified, they actually passed uh, legislation that made it a, a crime uh, in 1999 to bribe overseas. The, one of the issues was there had been this culture that had existed before uh, where there was bribery and indeed in Germany you could take an overseas bribe and consider it a business expense and deduct it uh, on your taxes. I mean, it was that, was, it was that uh, blatant. Um, and so there had to be this incredible change after 99, um, but it didn't happen. And that, um, you know, some of the, some of the issues um, were that there was really little ethics training or whistleblower, meaningful whistleblowing things. Senior officers were not disciplined if there were problems. Uh, the units had little supervision from the center. There was a lot of decentralization back to the point we've been talking about versus 
uniform culture versus decentralized culture, a lot of decentralization in terms of people being able to make uh, their own uh, decisions, compliance and audit were understaffed or ignored. Um, there was a, um, red flags were ignored uh, in many cases when auditors would see that things looked like improper uh, payments. They, the senior management didn't pay any attention. Uh, there was no company-wide uh, guidelines on consultants, the issues that I've just talked about. Uh, and indeed, uh, such a step for guidelines was explicitly rejected in 2000. Um, on and on and on. The audit committee was not given accurate information. Um, and the Justice Department in settling the case was Siemens, quote, the internal investigation revealed knowing failures to implement and circumvention of internal controls up to the most senior echelons of management. Internal investigation revealed, no, internal investigation by Siemens revealed knowing failures done by my friend here, knowing failures to implement and circumvention of internal controls up to the most senior echelons of management. The result was that they discovered about at least $2 billion of bribes across the major international divisions, health, power, rail, communications. Uh, there were 2,000 phony business consulting agreements where they were um, basically funneling funds to decision makers through uh, these phony consulting agreements. Um, took place over many years in every geography and fundamental failures to prevent, detect, and respond of the first order. Um, then a new management came in um, and having clearly failed to, to prevent, they began an enormous uh, cleanup effort, which was the right thing to do. They hired law firms, uh, forensic accountants, uh, they had a huge internal legal staff. I mean, the number I have is like 100 lawyers inside who were working on it, but maybe it was not. Does that, does that sound about right or maybe even more? More. more. Yeah. Um, you know, hundreds of support staff, you know, in 34 nations, 750 interviews, 800 informational meetings, 100 million documents, 24,000 produced for government. It was a massive effort. Um, and it started in, 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 in one country, and then they felt obligated to go look all around the world, not just in the one division where it started, but in all the other divisions. Um, and so, uh, it was an incredible effort. Uh, they created an ombud system, central control of bank accounts, changed the internal controls, um, new education and training, suspended all the consulting agreements, fired a lot of individuals, um, including the heads of all these major businesses, and basically the CEO at the time asked to have his contract renewed, and the board said, we're in the middle of the investigation, we can't renew your contract, and then he quit. Uh, he's now the head of Alcoa. Um, and so it was a major, uh, major, 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 major issue. And it really, if you look at it, and you'll, you are going to get to it in the spring, it will show you the, the classic case of a com all the problems, all the failures of a compliance program that are imaginable occurred here, but all the steps that were necessary to fix it were taken uh, by the new management, I mean, who did a fantastic job. And the Justice Department said that they had received they first criticized Siemens for having these leaders and all these problems, the, the, the problems in all the way the upper restaurants of the company, but then they said about the people who came in and cleaned it up and settled it, extraordinary cooperation in connection with the investigation of its past corporate conduct and has undertaken uncommonly sweeping remedial action in response to the discovery of prior misconduct. Setting a standard going forward for the type of multinational cooperation that can be greatly enhanced worldwide law enforcement efforts in involving, involving corruption of foreign officials. Uh, so it was a, it was a amazing decline and a remarkable uh, recovery. Uh, the damage to the company was significant. Um, they had to restate expenses, which before 1999 briberies could be expensed, as I said, but they <coughs> couldn't be afterwards, so they had that cost $500 million. The cost of the investigation is a billion dollars billion dollars, lawyers and forensic accountants. Um, the fines and penalties all in approached uh, two billion or more. Uh, lost top management, fired the general counsel prior to the current general counsel. Uh, uh, lost many lower level employees. They had to have an amnesty program, which is very interesting, but we don't have time to go into. Um, enormous time and effort uh, on the part of the company. They were nearly debarred by the World Bank from future contracts and agreed to pay $100 million over 10 years for going, doing good works, including one that takes place at the school. Um, so 
was it worth all the effort to do the remedial work? Uh, probably because they were charged, without getting in technical terms, they were charged under, in the U.S., under something called the books and records provision of the anti-bribery law, which is just they didn't record things right as opposed to the corruption part, the actual bribery part. If they'd been convicted of the bribery part, they could have been debarred, as one of you said, uh, maybe it was you, they could have been debarred um, from getting any U.S. government contracts. And Siemens does, correct me if I'm wrong, $40 billion plus or minus uh, business in the United States, and, and the government is a big uh, customer. The U.S. government is a big customer. So that would have been uh, a tremendous uh, blow. Um, some of you may have read the story of Walmart. Uh, anyone from any, who's, who here has read the story of the Walmart problems in Mexico? We will have a case study on that but, in the courts. Yeah, well, it, just an, another example of where there was bribery in Mexico led by the CEO of Mexico aided and abetted by the general counsel of Mexico where Walmart trying to expand its stores would bribe to get environmental permits <clears throat> or zoning variances or things like that. It came to um, Walmart headquarters. Some lawyers said that it needed to be investigated. Some internal investigators said it needed to be investigated. The general counsel of the company and the CEO of the company said no, we don't want to go there. They kicked it back uh, to Mexico where the general counsel killed the investigation. And then about three years later, one of the lawyers who had been involved in Mexico became a whistleblower, and there was a huge front page story in the U.S. papers. And now Walmart's doing what Siemens had to do. We don't know the result yet. They're investigating their activities all over the world. So that once you have one of these scandals and it's endemic, um, you're then off to the races in terms of the kinds of things that you have to, uh, to, you have to fix. Um, so these are, uh, these are profound profound questions. Um, there, 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 on the other hand, there was a case involving Morgan Stanley uh, that shows you what a good program will do for you, where in a nutshell they had a vice president in China who was basically bribing people. Um, but the Justice Department in the United States decided that they would indict him, but that they would not indict the company because the company actually had a really good program. They had discovered the problem. They had done every, it was the bad apple as opposed to the, the bad culture uh, case, uh, they decided that he was a bad apple and he was indicted. Uh, but they gave the company a pass, uh, which uh, is, was a good signal because what it showed multinational companies was that basically if you did have a good program, you, weren't, you, you, you could escape problems. Um, and this was, a, this was a great example. Okay, that is just a nutshell, a little window into this huge problem of what companies do themselves. But that's not all that they have to do. And we have about two minutes left, so I'm not going to be able to say very much. But companies should be involved in these international conventions where they basically try to level the playing field across the globe. As I said before, the OECD convention basically makes <coughs> foreign bribery uh, a crime. The convention has no force unless the, each nation, the 34, now 37, developed nations enacted into their own law. A convention by itself has no binding effect. But if Germany passes a law, England passes a law, France passes a law that basically is consistent with or verbatim with uh, the, uh, the convention, it then becomes the positive law of that particular country. And, and so the, the, com the companies have to, have to act properly. As we saw that was part of the problem that Siemens did not make the adjustment when the law changed in Germany uh, for a variety of, uh, I'm sure, extremely complicated uh, uh, cultural reasons. So one thing to do is to wor work about the, worry about these conventions, but it's very hard to make corruption an international uh, uh, treaty issue because in this period of, of international competition, countries are very concerned about jobs and trade. If you go after companies, that are bribing overseas, you may be hurting your national champions who are getting, creating jobs and, and balance of payments and whatever, whatever else for the country. So this OECD convention, um, and there are many others, there's a, there's a UN con convention, uh, but it's the one that's most known because of the international, uh, because of the developed country uh, um, membership. It has a very mixed record because many, many developed countries simply won't enforce it. 
they may have passed the law, but they won't enforce it because they're fundamentally, especially in times of recession, much more concerned about trade <coughs> and um, uh, uh, jobs than they are about their, their moral commitment, their legal commitment under the convention. And this is a long and complicated story, but it just gives, this just gives you a flavor of if you're in companies, in these international companies, there are these kinds of activities that are critically important. Then there are the international financing organizations, places like the World Bank, the European Bank for Re uh, Recovery and Development, uh, Reconstruction. Right? Reconstruction and Development, um, the Asian Development Bank, uh, where they all have uh, at least the idea of building capacity in, develop in developing countries. But that's an enormously complicated question, and yet, as I indicated at the outset, when you look at the harms of corruption, it ought to be of enormous uh, concern to global companies because at the end of the day, operating in these societies where there is no law, where there is corruption, is a very iffy proposition. I mean, you, you, even if you have the right values and the right um, uh, ethics, it, it's very hard to operate. And, uh, and everything you do is, 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 is very difficult and you have to look at it very carefully. So at the end of the day, uh, these companies at some level, the development agenda is a really important part of the next 30 years where we're looking at these societies um, that are, uh, you know, not developed, quite corrupt, no, tra no transparency, no accountability, um, and very hard to do business. And, you know, to me, one of the challenges that you all will face, depending on what kind of business you go in, is how do, how do companies deal with corruption internally? How do you deal with it in terms of international conventions for developed world? How do you deal with institutions like the World Bank, which are trying to do things, but in a world of wash in capital, the World Bank's money is not that valuable anymore because there's so much private capital? And then how do you get involved in the development agenda in the countries themselves when you're an outsider? You know, what, what, is, what is GE going to do in Nigeria? Um, what, what kind of role uh, could it play? We don't have time to get into it. Maybe when we have questions tomorrow, we can talk about that. Um, but that is, let, let's have your question before we, before I go to bed. Um, so you taking this from the business perspective that a, uh, a government is trying to bribe, you know, a government is asking for a bribe from a company. Do you see that? Do you see there being a possibility where it's reversed? Such as, uh, as you mentioned, com countries are competing for jobs. So they're lowering uh, taxes or reducing taxes completely. Is that a reverse form of bribery? I think if it's, if it's on the table, in other words, that they're clearly <coughs> trying to get uh, jobs, as this is, you know, happens across Europe, happens in the United States, um, and there's a public policy debate about whether or not they're going to give them tax breaks or real estate, you know, give them land or something like that. Uh, I, think, I think you can make a, 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 a distinction between incentives and inducements that are legal and bribery. Basically what bribery is asking people to do is do things that are, that are not in their, in their job description and make a decision that's not consistent with their responsibilities. Um, having a state basically try to attract business, you know, I don't think is a... Is, uh, is, is, is in that category. Yeah. Sorry, uh, just following up on this. Uh, I'm also from Hungary, the Hungarian government. Can you speak up, I'm sorry. Yes. So I'm also from Hungary, and the Hungarian government has this approach of uh, basically conducting individual contracts with certain multinationals, but like not all of them, so they're being selected in a sense. So, how would you? I don't, I don't know enough about that. I mean, uh, I don't know what the selection criteria are or what the... Yeah, that's the thing. I mean, if sometimes, sometimes there are things like local content where they want jobs provided in the country. I mean, sometimes there can be legitimate criteria that might be considered from an economic point of view protectionist or not free trading, but that are certainly legal. Uh, I mean, where, you, where your argument against them would be not a legal argument, it's not corruption per se, but it, you know, depending on your theory, your economic theory of trade may not be the right way to do it. So I think we have to make that distinction. But I, I, I need to know more about what the, yeah. what, what the criteria was. Yeah. 
anyway, I've kept you guys long enough. You've been really kind to at least sit there. Um, and uh, I, I hope you'll be willing to put up with three more hours of me tomorrow morning. Thank you very much.